Don't forget about the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Rich Outfield. Look at this fat guy. And Big Anklevich. Hey, I'm not that fat, please. Good fortune to you, sir and ma'am and Marshall Latham. <laughs> Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Episode 128. I'm Big Anklevich. <laughs> and I'm Rich Outfield. And thank you for joining us again. I've already told him what the show is called, right? It's been so long, I don't remember how we do the show. I don't either. Yeah, it really has. Uh, we're the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Hope you like to listen. Wait. And vote for us in the Parsec Awards because they made a category just for us that we will lose in. How could you have ever been nominated for a Parsec? Uh, today's episode... Is it fair to call this one a special episode? <laughs> like short bus kind of special or? Well, I prefer like handy capable special. Oh, okay. Yeah, that I think is fair. A extremely slow, I mean special episode of the Dunes. Sorry. It is called. Unfortunate. By. By B.D. Anklevich. Do we need to explain who B.D. Anklevich is? <laughs> About the author. B.D. Anklevich is me. Thank you, Announcer Man. Oh, and ladies and gentlemen, Announcer Man. This is all we've got for you tonight. I'm going for a smoke break. <laughs> okay, thank you. Wow. We hadn't had him on in so long. And... Oh, there you go. Okay, so yes, we've got a story for you. And uh, there's kind of interesting circumstances that surround the story. And once the story's over, I think we'll talk about that. But we'll go ahead and let you get right into the story. Hope you enjoy it. They're chomping at the bit for uh, this one. Chomping on something anyways. Hey, don't grab yourself. It's, a, it's an audio <laughs> podcast. All right. Enjoy the story, folks. See you in a minute. Unfortunate by B.D. Anklovich. Do you believe in fortunes? Charmaine asked, picking her cookie up off the plate and cracking it open. Fortunes? Fortune cookie fortunes? Like, do I believe they'll come true? <laughs> You're kidding, right? Jeffrey said. <laughs> I've had a lot of them come true for me. She said, smiling and slipping a piece of the broken cookie between her lips. She had beautiful lips. He hoped to kiss those lips before the night was over. Well, yeah, so have I. But that's just because if you make something vague enough, it'll happen to most anyone. He waved his hands in the air in mock drama. You will eat a crisp, tasteless treat after Chinese dinner. <laughs> he said in a bad impression of a Chinese accent. She laughed, but not much. More of a charity laugh than anything. Crap. He thought. Was it the accent? Was that taking it too far? It was a racist thing to do after all. Crap. Look, she said, holding up her paper and reading. Soon a new acquaintance shall delight you. She raised her eyebrows, looking at him across the table. Does that sound like something that might come true? Huh? Wow. Jeff smiled. Definitely. In fact, that's something I can guarantee. Charmaine looked down and flashed him a coquettish smile. Something hung in the air between them, as if the atmosphere had been electrically charged. Jeffrey wouldn't have been surprised to discover that his hair was all standing on end. Charmaine spoke, breaking the spell. What does yours say? Oh, yeah, he said, trying to reel his mind back from the place it had just gone. He tried to break his cookie open cleanly, but instead wound up crushing it to tiny bits. He chuckled at the mess he'd made of it, <laughs> and pulled the paper out of the crumbs and shards. Powder fell from it as he looked at the words written across the paper in cheerful pink capital letters. The smile dropped off his face. What the hell? He muttered. What is it? Charmaine asked. Is something wrong? Jeff looked around the restaurant, finding the employees and checking to see if they were watching him. What is it, Jeff? He couldn't answer. He was too freaked out. Who the hell sent this fortune cookie to my table? Do they think it would be a funny joke? Because it's not funny. Jeff continued to look anxiously around the dining room. Charmaine reached across the table and grabbed the fortune from his fingers. Oh my god, she said, then read it out loud. Your life is in danger. Tell no one. 
Leave the city, never come back? She looked up at him. This is messed up, Jeff. Jeff caught sight of his waiter. He raised his hand, signaling him. He strode over quickly. How is everything? Are you ready for your check? No, hey, I just got this fortune cookie. He said, grabbing the paper off the table where Charmaine had dropped it and thrusting it at the waiter. It's some kind of sick joke. Is this what you guys think is funny around here? The waiter glanced down at the fortune, a quizzical look spread over his features. This is certainly uncalled for, sir, but this isn't from one of our fortune cookies. Jeff's anger was rising. What are you talking about? I just picked it up off the plate that you brought me. I'm sorry. I don't mean to confuse you, sir. Yes, I brought you the plate, but there was something wrong about it because our fortunes are not like this one. Ours are written in blue ink and also have lucky numbers beneath. This one does not have numbers and is written in pink. Charmaine held up her own paper. He's right, Jeff. Look. The fortune Charmaine had received followed the restaurant's format. Blue ink, lucky numbers. So how the hell did I wind up with this one? Are you telling me you don't even know what you're serving here? Jeez, it scares me to think of what might have been in my meal. Sir, I am sorry. I will check with the cooks to find out who placed these cookies on the plate I brought you. It is usually Phil, the busboy. I will talk to him now and be right back. The waiter strode off, disappearing through swinging doors into the kitchen. They could hear an animated conversation in Chinese through the doors. At least Jeff thought it was Chinese. It could have been Korean or Hmong, for all he knew of the languages. Charmaine and Jeff shared a look, and Jeff grimaced in sympathy for the guy. It sounded like he might be getting reamed out by the waiter. A moment later, the waiter led a cowering Asian youth of perhaps 17, but more likely 15, out of the kitchen. Sir, I am terribly sorry. This is Phil, the busboy. He says that he put two of our regular fortune cookies on the plate and that someone must have changed it after. The busboy broke in, speaking in Chinese to the waiter. The waiter retorted sharply back to him in Chinese. Jeff could only guess what they were saying, but suddenly Charmaine held up her hand to the two of them and babbled off a string of Chinese herself. Charmaine can speak Chinese? She just gets better and better. Whoa, said Jeff. I didn't know you spoke Chinese. Yeah, I do. Uh, You know what? Hold on a minute. Let me take care of this for you. She stood up, said something to the waiter and busboy in Chinese, then herded them both to the kitchen. Jeff sat at the table, bereft of anything to occupy himself with. He looked around the restaurant, picked at the remains of his fortune cookie, then finally pulled out his phone to start playing Angry Birds when Charmaine returned. She had a new member of the kitchen staff by her side. This one cowered even worse than the busboy had. Okay, Jeff, the bottom has been gotten to. This guy here is Tom. He thought it would be funny to put a scary fortune into one of the cookies. He says he was trying to play a harmless joke. Apparently, he watches too many horror movies in his time off. She turned to Tom and nodded. He stepped forward and haltingly said, So sorry. She nodded again, and he scurried away, tail between his legs, disappearing through the kitchen doors. That was that. The waiter comped them their meals because of the mishap, and in moments they were out on the street, heading toward Jeff's car. Jeff was hoping that the stupid fortune cookie incident didn't ruin the chemistry that seemed to have been building between the two of them. His fortune cookie may not have held any promise, but hers certainly seemed to. They found his car, and he got his keys out to unlock her door when Charmaine started and looked into the alley they were parked next to. What was that? She asked, moving towards the alley. I didn't hear anything, Jeff said from the car, pulling her door open. Suddenly, Charmaine jogged into the alley, leaving Jeff standing there, holding her door for her. Charmaine? He shouted. She disappeared into the darkness between the high-rise buildings. What is it? Hey, Jeff, come here. Charmaine sounded enchanted, like a child that had just discovered a neat new bug. Jeff sighed and closed and locked the passenger door, shoved his keys into his pocket, and made his way into the darkness of the alley. His footsteps scraped on the concrete and echoed off the buildings as he made his way deeper. He couldn't see a thing, especially not Charmaine. (laughs) Then he heard her giggle. Are you ready to delight me? She asked out of the darkness. Jeff, instantly excited, picked up his pace. Charmaine, 
Where are you? I can't see anything. Suddenly, her form stepped out of the darkness from behind a dumpster. She put an arm around his shoulder and her lips to his ear. I specifically told you not to tell anyone. Huh? Jeff started, but didn't even get all the way through the confused grunt before Charmaine rammed a pointed kitchen knife deep into his chest. Blood spurted red and strong from the wound, and Jeff fell back against the dumpster and slid to the ground. Charmaine squatted at his side, her beautiful lips parting into a big, attractive smile. See, Jeff, that fortune was right. That really was delightful. Author's note. No, announcer man, I don't think we'll do an author's note. We have a precedent, right? Well, yeah. When it's one of our stories, we just talk, right? Yeah, the whole thing is an author's note, sort of, kind of, because the author's here to talk about it, I guess. I don't know. Uh, We should do a cast list. Okay. Announcer man, do you want to say after this? He's gone. (laughs) Cast list is, I believe I read the story. That's right. You were the narrator and you played... The waitor. Oh, yeah. He never had a name, huh? He was just called The Waiter. The other guys were called Phil and Tom. And I think Tom had one line, and that was me. And Jeff? And I was Jeff also. Who was Phil? Phil didn't ever have any lines. He just spoke in Chinese, which we didn't attempt. Yeah, that's something I guess we could talk about, but we won't. And who was Charmelante? M. Knight. Charmaine. <laughs> Charmaine was played by Julie Hoverson. With how much notice? Very little. Seconds. Yes. We demanded that she be done the very night that we sent it to her, and she wasn't. She Um. always is. It's so (laughs) creepy. How many times have we told this story? But we will send her an email saying, hey, we're recording tonight. Could you do some lines for us? And before we're done recording, they will be in our inbox. (laughs) She is a professional consummate. Something like that. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, me also for reading that we seriously didn't have any other voices <laughs> no that was the point of the whole thing oh okay there was a point to the whole thing everybody gather around the fire so we will tell the long sad tale of the dune Steve audio fiction magazine <laughs> once there was a podcast we tried to be weekly then we tried to be monthly <laughs> then we killed ourselves <laughs> the end no elaborate well, shoot, what was our last episode before this one? Um, last one was Final Words of Biggie Smalls. <laughs> the Last Words of Daniel Shupak was episode 127. Why John? Oh. Which came out on March 31st, 2012. So going on a month. We'll be lucky Bro. to have an episode in April. If we get this out very quickly, because we're recording this the 23rd. That means we're going to get this whole thing, because we recorded the story Five minutes ago. We just finished. Now we're doing the wait, episode wait, wait. for it. April 23rd, we recorded the story. When did the story get written? <laughs> well, that, that's part of the story, Oh, that's part too. of the story. Okay. I'll get to that. And back in the day when we thought we could do a weekly show, we were so naive in that oh, early oh, oh. second decade of the 21st century. We sent out a list of stories to all our producers and said, either choose one of these or it will be chosen for you. And here's the date we would like it done. And for a while that worked. And then it started to not work. And when it didn't work, it really didn't work. Yeah. I don't know. Something happened. And it's, it's mostly me because I was the one that used to do most of the story producing. And then as I brought in producers to try and help me out because I was becoming less and less capable of doing so. Handy capable. Yes, I was becoming handy capable. Um, <laughs> less and less handy capable. <laughs> oh. Yeah, as I became less capable, I was trying to get other people to help me out. And I think I just got lazy, maybe. I don't know. I, I definitely relied on everyone else. And I don't know things got in the way of other people finishing their stories. And their deadlines passed and I wasn't working on anything. I didn't have anything ready to go in case something like this happened. And all of a sudden, here we are. And the whole of April has almost gone by and we've got nothing. Do you remember the day when I said, what story are you working on next, Big? And you said, F*** you. <laughs> and I was just like, wow. 
Do you remember that day? Because yes, I, I do. That was last time we recorded two weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> we've both gotten very fat too. It's 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 the corporate fat cats That's that we've right. become. We just sit around smoking cigars and wearing top hats and tuxedos. <laughs> hey, Biggie, another donation came in. <laughs> yeah, can buy some more Cubans. And by Cubans, he means young boys from Cuba, not cigars. We yeah. do not endorse smoking on this show. That's right. Going for a smoke break, guys. That was was that irony? Again, I never understand the thing. A, a bunch of accidents or coincidences or power outages or computer fallings down things happened in a row to prevent us from having our next two or three episodes done when they were supposed to happen and i don't know if it was you or me but but one of us said well we're not going to have an episode the whole month of april i don't know there was something scary about that (laughs) because part of what makes other podcasts succeed, and and I would assume us as well, is that you develop a rapport with your audience or you develop like a almost a relationship, a, a feeling where it's like, oh, there's a new episode of Drabblecast out right now. You know, oh, I'm going to find out what funny stuff Norm has to say. I've missed Norm. It's been 11 days instead of seven. And, and a lot of podcasts, when they start to intermittently put out shows, They lose that. They lose that connection with their audience. I don't want to call it a dependency. It's not a drug kind of thing, but it is sort of a connection that has to be maintained by constant contact or frequent contact. Have I said anything even remotely close to what's right yet? Yeah, I think that you're somewhere in the neighborhood, the ballpark at least. And so we've been trying to do that gets my goats and and, and we've been trying to get together. We didn't get together last week and keep putting out new material. So that people don't say, oh, well, those guys are done, or it's been so long, I can let it go, and all that, which is fine if you feel that way. F*** you, like (laughs) Big said, but it's fine. (laughs) And so it's like, oh, shoot, what are we going to do? And it's not just you, because I accepted a story way back, when did I say it was? August? And said, I will produce that, and I'm about half through it. It is the most ambitious audio project I've done for a production. But at the same time, that's no excuse because Brian Lincoln puts out unbelievably complicated episodes in no time of HG World. (laughs) (laughs) No, no, I was talking about our show. Anyhow, when was it? Two days ago? We were we're having a conversation on the computer. We right. we haven't seen each other in a couple of weeks. Yeah, we were IMing each other back and forth, and I was saying we were e shunting yeah. back and forth. <laughs> that's a little uh, preview for you. Oh, folks. yeah, that's too inside baseball or inside <laughs> croquet, if you want. Um, but yeah, we were talking back and forth, and I was saying maybe I, I think I may have asked you first. I said, "Hey, do you have a story that's short that we could just throw together? Just have." ready like if one that's just like a thousand or so words that we could just because i could edit that real quick and wouldn't be a big deal and you said oh i just did the last one come on you douche write something did i that sounds like me it was something close especially the ah but (laughs) yeah i didn't remember saying that you probably didn't write out the ah because it was writing you know we were were typing this up so you probably skipped that part but uh, it was something like that and i said all right and then I thought, you know, what would be interesting is to see if I could just go to one of those websites where they just give you like a story prompt and then you just write something from that. I wonder if I could just go to one of those and write a story like over this weekend. And I think it was Thursday or Friday probably that we were talking. And it's Monday now. So I said, maybe I can get one written so that I could have it ready by Monday for when we do our, our next episode, when we get together next time. And you were like, whatever, I guess I better start looking through my list of stories because you'll never do that. I went to a a site and I started looking at the uh, prompts that they had. And I found one fairly early on that I thought, that's a good one. I'll I'll try and do that. And I read a few others too. And I actually considered what I really was going to do was get two stories written in that time. And I was going to let you choose which one that you liked best. What are you, Nathaniel Lee? (laughs) Didn't work out. There was a lot of kind of stuff going on. My wife's parents were in town this weekend, etc., etc. So I managed to get some stuff written 
at the end of last week, and then I finished the story this afternoon at about what? When did I send it to you? Like four thirty? It was. Yeah, because our angry emails back and forth were at ten to five. <laughs> so well, yeah, four thirty. I sent it to him, and I said, "Okay, here's that story I said I was going to write. I just finished it, so you can look it over, and maybe we can." Do it tonight for the show. What do you think? You know, I was impressed because, oh, there's no way to say this without it sounding like a criticism. (laughs) Because some people say that they will do stuff and that (laughs) Scott Pig will say that he's going to write a story and then he doesn't. And then 10 years go by and Scott Pig still talks about writing his alien love story story <laughs> and scott pig doesn't write it i don't think um, scott pig has ever done any of that stuff <laughs> why are you dragging scott pig through the mud like that just because his name amuses me okay i guess that makes sense no uh, you you followed through and you did it in in no time at all and i think you tried to write a story that we could record just ourselves why you had a chinese speaking female <laughs> character i can't figure out but one of those things that happened as i was writing it i kind of wrote it as i went along and and some of the stuff the ending was not really in my mind until after i'd started going that kind of changed up as i went is that typical for you not really no usually i have the plot and and the ending pretty well nailed down before i start i would say at least 90 percent of the time i don't go into stories blindly very often because i'm too afraid that I'll waste my time at it and then get to the end and be like, "Eh, I don't know, I guess I'll start a new one. I think I'm exactly the same way. If I have a strong ending to work toward, that sometimes gives me the push, the the motivation. It's like, oh, I, I, I gotta get to that ending. And if I don't know where it's going, at some point I'll hit a wall where I'll say, this is crap, I've wasted my time. Or I'll say, it could end this way or it could end this way. And I've always felt like Julie has already gotten the lines back to us, folks. (laughs) Wow. And and so, yeah, for me, I I need to know where I'm going. I know other writers aren't like that. But, you know, don't tell me how to raise my kids. (laughs) I can just finish getting these real fast. So while you're, you're emailing Julie back, you know, we really ought to have a couple episodes like this already recorded and edited you know like an emergency uh, like a slush fund no no no, like a (laughs) like a a guest host or somebody uh oh jay leno choked on his own vomit today can you fill in sort of thing where we'll be like shoot you know it's gonna happen again we're not we don't have any stories ready to go but we have one of our own ready to go kind of a lose-lose for the audience really (laughs) but it, it just would it would be neat to have a couple stories just like behind glass in case of emergency it's not a bad idea and do several short ones kind of like these where uh, they're not too long not too short we talk about like old movies like we we discuss raiders of the lost ark or something like that so it never seems like it's not timely oh that's not a bad (laughs) idea so this experience of the last 48 hours or however long you've done this (laughs) Was it a a positive experience? It was. It was really nice. I enjoyed a lot just kind of trying to go after it. And that's that's one thing that I don't do a whole lot of. And and I think I really need to do a lot more of. And I think it might improve my writing a lot is just trying to take an idea and go with it. I have, and I've talked about it on the show lots of times, you know, I have, oh, I have this idea about Alien Love Story or whatever. I have like this cache of ideas that I just, hoard them you know that I've got them hidden away and I'm saving them in my head for when I write and I develop them a little bit here and there and and everywhere but I never go with them maybe I'm afraid that it's not ready enough or I don't know what but it's, it's nice to just write you know that's what everybody says you need to do writers write a writer is someone who writes every day you know you you are whatever it is you do every day so you're, you're the guy that you're the I'm guy a wanker that, yes If you're the guy that picks up the garbage, then you're the garbage man because you do that every day. That's your job. If you want to be a writer, you got to do it every day. And sometimes that idea is not ready to go. And so you just got to write something, you know. 
it was a fun experience to do that. I did some goofy stuff with it. Like, for example, all the characters. I thought, you know what? Since we're going to put it on the show, like this week, I'm just going to name it after people who donate to the show. So Charmaine Norwood, you might have recognized your name in the show. Or Tom Tancredi. Or Phil Keen. Jeffrey Moore, you guys were all the people who the characters were named after. Each time I came up with another character, I was like, oh, I need another name. And so I'd go into the uh, email and search for people who donated and throw it in there. You should have called the Chinese restaurant Nigel's. That's <laughs> second draft. I, I guess I could have, yeah. Nigel just turned off the show. So well, when did the ending come to you did you have another ending in mind for it was always going to end badly i thought you know because that was kind of the prompt was you gotta uh oh what was the prompt i'm sorry I ne- we never covered that the prompt was you got a fortune cookie that said get out of town tell no one your life is in danger and then that was the prompt go wow so that specific it was yeah i was kind of surprised it was a little more specific than i would have expected Some of them were a little more vague. Other ones were kind of like that one that you did the contest for not too long ago, where it was like, fear of insects, luau, and hang gliding, hang gliding, you know, and you had to make something that included all those. They had some that were like that. They had some that were a little more specific, like the one that I went with. I only made it through like the first 20 before I said, yeah, I'll go with that one. And I went with it. I thought the tell no one thing that was the I, thought, that was the I, I wanted to put that in there, you know, that was the reason why. And then I thought somebody was going to stab this guy for telling someone, you know, in the But end. if he had not made a big deal, if he had said, hey, uh, uh, you know, I know we're having a great date and I like the cut of your blouse, <clears throat> but I've got to go. Well, he would have survived? Probably. Yeah. I mean, he wouldn't know that. Well, is the Chinese restaurant in on it? What did she do in the back room to get this guy to come out and say, so sorry? I think I think uh, what she does when she goes in there is she just goes in there and says, oh, you guys don't need to worry about it. He's just upset about, you know, she makes up a story, says he doesn't like this. And if you just come out and say you're sorry, then it'll be no big deal. But yeah. she doesn't have a relationship with these Chinese No, the Chinese restaurant to... is not in on it at all and she But maybe like the egg foo young, the 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 orange chicken isn't chicken, but this is where they get their meat. <laughs> I guess if you wanted to go there. I mean, obviously it's open-ended as far as that goes, so you could go uh, there there's lots of stories about Vietnamese restaurants where the cats all go missing and and the dogs in the neighborhood disappear, so could be something like that. But uh, in my mind, she didn't have any relationship with them at all. She probably has the fortune cookie that he really got in her purse or something like that. And she just traded them out when the uh, cookies came to their table. Are these questions that an author doesn't want to be asked? I don't know. It was like, what was behind the other three doors? <laughs> like, I don't know. That was 1963. Who, who are you? Some authors might be annoyed by that, perhaps. I think it just depends on what you want to say or don't want to say. The fact that I have an answer is makes it good. <laughs> you ask the question and I could say, oh, no, they weren't in on it. It was all her thing. And she, you know, whereas if you yeah. ask me, I go. We would have cut yeah, out the question. No. Stupid douchebag trying to make me look bad. <laughs> I asked you the Jamie Lee Curtis question and ended <laughs> the interview. Okay, well, I, I, I think that this was an experiment that, well, it was successful because you wrote a story. Yeah, that's good. And huh? here we are again with a new episode. And hopefully next week or the week after or whenever I get mine done, we will have another episode and all will be right with the universe again. Yeah, that's fine. And now it's time to talk about something completely different. How do you know whether your story sucks or not? How do you know if anyone cares? (laughs) All right, we're not going to do the drums. That's less effective. Hey, folks, as of the day we're recording this, All of the Broken Mirror story 
submissions have been read and rated. deemed unworthy. Yes, we're not going to bother <laughs> producing any of them. No, they've, they've, they've all been judged and proclaimed guilty. Harshly, especially by Rich Outfield and my story. <laughs> See, he doesn't like wearing my shoes. And look at him squirm. <laughs> I could quote your own words back to you, but I censored myself for two weeks now, even though it's been at the tip of my tongue. Several weeks ago, when we were talking about writing, talking about submitting our stories for this contest or for other places or for... Why do you smile? I just enjoy joking around about you giving my story a five. Yes. <laughs> I don't really care to you tell you the care. truth, but I like to uh, joke about it because I, I like to <laughs> Methinks thou squirrel. dust protest too much. <laughs> a, a few weeks ago, we had a conversation on, I think it was on the air, or maybe it was on That Gets My Goat, about our own writing, about having confidence in the things that we've written, and, and, and something that has always troubled me for years and years is... Not knowing the quality of my own work. You know, you submit it somewhere, it doesn't win, it gets a rejection, and you think, well, maybe that story wasn't any good. Mm -hmm. We talked a little bit back and forth about how do you know if it's any good, if what you've written is good or bad. Is there an empirical way to look at something and say, that is good, with a capital G? And I don't think we ever came up with a definitive answer. Uh -huh. So I asked the, I think it was the people on Facebook, maybe it was the people on the forums, if they could give me their opinion or their experience. Um, and I've, I found that people, especially the people that are willing to put themselves out there more than I am, uh -huh. tend to have a more healthy view of themselves and of their own work. And maybe because of my crazy mental state, it's, it's, it's beyond healthy. It's like a, an inflated vision of themselves. But I, I think that we've talked about that. It's like that seems to be necessary. If, you know, you go to Hollywood to be an actress, you've got to have the belief that you're the prettiest girl there in the audition line. Or, you know, the, these awful people that we see on American Idol, the very first couple episodes, right. they all seem to think they sing like angels. Otherwise, they wouldn't stand in line for hours all night just for the chance to sing in front of a camera and later be mocked by millions. But anyhow, I just thought that I would share uh, some of the things that the listeners have uh, written down. But uh, before I do, have you got any ideas or any anything that you'd like to share before I read this stuff? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, we talked about it before. I don't remember what I said then, so I'm probably just going to say the same thing or perhaps the exact opposite thing that I said last time. But yeah, I mean, I'm not really sure how you can know if something is good. I, I think I know when something that I write is good and when something that I write is not good and in the scale of things that I write, I can say this is better than that, or this is better than that, that I've written. How it compares to other people's stuff, I don't know. But well, that, that's going to be harder. And, and really, this is us judging ourselves or us competing with ourselves in this right. conversation. Because something that you write may speak to a person in a totally different way than something your neighbor writes or, or your, you know, your little right. brother writes. But we can't write like them. We can just be the best that we can be. That right. we can be. And and, and and that's the thing is, you, you know, my mom is oft, often telling me, you should write something like The Hunger Games or you <laughs> should write something like Twilight or you should write something like Percy Jackson. And I'll be like, well, Ma, everybody thinks that, that if I just rip off whatever is popular now, I will sell. But you can't do that. You have to write what you would want to read. And, and it's so much work to write a novel that I, I don't know how you could write an entire novel just hoping to ape what is currently popular. You have to motivate yourself. You have to get yourself up every single day and write on this thing. And if you don't care about it, well, maybe there's the possibility of a paycheck there to motivate you. But for me, holy cow, if I'm writing a story and I start to suspect that it sucks, there's a, a, like a 90% chance I'm not going to get to the end of that story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's definitely that way. And for example, the story uh, that I did for the Broken Mirror story, I knew when I was writing it and when it was done that it wasn't one of my best stories. 
Okay, so you knew, but why, when you were writing it, if it hadn't been for the contest, would you have finished that story? Are you like me in that way? I might have finished it. I probably would have finished it just because it was short. It's one of the shortest things I've written, too. It was only like 2,000-something words, so I probably would have got to the end of it and managed to finish it. It's hard to say. Because that is why I wrote I probably wouldn't have ever started it to begin with, to tell you the truth, if it weren't for the contest, because I had to write something along those lines. So I did it. But I never even thought the idea was good enough to begin with, to tell you the truth. I probably wouldn't have written it had it not been for the contest. Do you ever just start writing, not knowing where you're going with it, not knowing if there's a good story in this or not, but I'm just I'm just going to write as sort of a flow of ideas, a stream of consciousness kind of thing. You know, I don't do that very much, and I really ought to. I mean, I, I just need to write more, and I think that could be something that I could do with that. Just, you know, start writing whatever. But yeah, I, I, I don't do it like I should. I endlessly try and think up ways to incentivize myself as I mentioned to you right before we started recording one of the things that I'd thought of but yeah I don't know when I'll finally get around to doing that I'll probably die first I don't know if anybody can truly motivate you better than you can motivate yourself ultimately it has to be you because writing is such a private thing when I hear about people who collaborate on an entire novel I don't know how that's possible because writing is something that you do by yourself for hours and hours without distractions, without other people to pull you away from it. You, you and I have collaborated a couple of times, but it's never been on something massive. Right. It, it seems like you have to be the one to push yourself and to say, okay, hey, 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 I can't watch what I want to watch or sleep or do whatever I want to do until I've written X number of words or pages. You know, even if you had somebody else, maybe that's what an agent is for, a girlfriend or a publisher, or the devil, just somebody that can, can push you along on that. With a pitchfork. L. Scribe Harris has a podcast and she's got a story on there about a sort of a magical bookstore or a magical writer's store. And there's a an, in the attic, there are muses that you can buy. And this guy buys a muse and it's to force him to finish his novel. And uh, the only way that he can finish it in the little amount of time that he has left is if this thing is threatening and pushing, you know, it's like, if you don't finish your novel. And part of me was just like, well, gosh, we all need this. We all need a threat on our lives. <laughs> yeah, he got to the point where he can't even eat. You know, it's just like, oh, crap, I'm not done yet. I, the end is is near, literally. And I don't know. There's no such thing as that in real life. I, I, maybe there's an Annie Wilkes out there that's forcing Paul Sheldon to write his book. But I, I think you wouldn't end up appreciating a situation like that. I'm sorry. Uh, there, was, there was one other thing. I think all of the Broken Mirror finalists, I'm going to ask them a couple of questions about their story. And they'll all be able to answer it in the author's note. And that way we can compare if people have different answers to the question. But for me, it's it's really, there's got to be something that grabs me, that makes me pay attention, that makes me think, oh, hey, that sounds really cool. I want to work toward that moment. Or often it's the end of the story. I know how I want this story to end. And it's great when you have to write the whole story to get to write the part you want to write. But then there's lots of times when I'll just skip ahead to that part because I don't know what I want to write in the meantime. And often those stories don't get that middle part written and that sucks. But anyhow, uh, it seems like I was, there was something I was going to say and I derailed myself, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> but because it's work, I mean, unless you can sit down and write a story from beginning to end, you need something that brings you back day after day or week after week to this same project, some kind of passion and some kind of drive and a belief that is worth doing. Right. And sometimes that's hard. I don't know. If, if we only opened our submissions again, maybe that would be a goal for and people. And you could but... start submitting things under uh, false names no, again. No, no. I meant for the people that are listening. <laughs> I... Anyhow, the question was, how do you know if it is good? Uh-huh. Adam Gifford said, I tend to write the story I want to read. If I try to write a story I feel someone else will like, the story usually fails because I'm just not that passionate about it. 
Some of my stories resonate with readers and some don't. I guess that's just the nature of my writing. I have two stories that I'm currently shopping around, which I think are some of my best works. While I am getting some positive reaction to them, no one is buying. I guess what I'm trying to say is that I write because I want to. I have stories to tell, and if someone wants to read them and buy them, great. If not, well, that's okay, too. As long as I'm having fun, that's all I need. I feel that if you are writing for a paycheck, you're doing it for the wrong reasons. Don't get me wrong, it feels great when someone wants to pay you for the time and effort you put into a story, but not many make a living writing. Do it for fun, and you'll never regret a minute of it. Wow, that was pretty good. I mean, that kind of encapsulated the whole conversation, didn't it? Uh, Do you want to read the second one? Sure. Mark Paxson says, Rarely do I know if I have written something that is good. I write the story that's in my head, and while writing it, try to work on things to make the story as compelling as possible. But ultimately, it's a crapshoot whether it's good or bad. Even if everybody I know who reads a piece says it was good, I'm never sure. Okay, well, there there you go. If he, that's how I am, too. I don't know. There's one story that I wrote called Round and Round that our f- mutual friend Ian said was the best thing that I ever wrote. And that resonated with me. I think for years afterward, I thought that was the best story I ever wrote. And I don't know if that thought started with me or it was because Ian said that. That he gave me that idea, and it's it's maddening to not know whether that was my own thought uh-huh. or not. Okay, so Rachel Roge said, "If your name isn't Rish Outfield, your stuff has to be better." Hey, Rish, why not write on the walls of your one room apartment with your brain sometime? Dallas Mavericks rule. <laughs> well, thanks, Rachel, for that. Uh, Jennifer Gifford said, "I write because it's my calling." I don't worry about word counts, themes, or trying to fit a piece into a market. I'm a storyteller, and the story tells me how it wants to be written. Whether it's a short 1,500-word piece or a longer 8,000-word story, it takes as long as it takes because it's the story narrating. I'm just the scribe. I never write with the intent of getting anything published or the dreams of making me famous. While those things are desirable, it's not my main objective. Like Adam, I have a couple of stories that I love and have received a number of compliments on, but haven't found a published home. I feel it in my bones and in the pit of my stomach when a story is spot on good. Sometimes, if I'm lucky, I'm aware of it while actually in the midst of the writing process. And when that happens, it's magical. That word count thing that she mentioned reminds me that last week or two weeks ago now, I guess there was a short story contest where they gave you a picture and they gave you a sentence that had to be in the story and they gave you a weekend to write it. They announced it on Friday. It was due first thing Monday morning. Uh And so I thought, I'm going to enter that. I think Leo Godin on Facebook said, why don't you enter this or F you or something like that? And I was like, cool. And so I I wrote a a tiny story, like the smallest stories I possibly could, based on the feeling I got from that picture. Uh And it was 500 words, which is super short, insanely short. But the length the story had to be was 150 words, plus or minus five. So it could be 145 to 155. And I spent hours chiseling that damn thing from 500 words to 155 words way way more time than i ever spent writing it or thinking about it ultimately i wondered if it was even worth doing what i did and i guess that's a question that only you can answer well i saw that story i mean you did send it to me at one point i don't know what length it was at (laughs) yes four days later i got a response from you yeah i didn't i didn't see it in time to help you any but i wouldn't have helped you any anyways because it was as short as it could have gone i suppose you chiseled more out of it and tried to enter it but i read that and i was like you need to expand this story sir you can't make this shorter it would suck if you made it any smaller And I think I've told you that before. I I remember you talking about that. And it may have been with your Broken Mirror story where you were just saying, hey, I don't know, it feels like it's getting long. 
that, that I was of the same opinion. Dude, tell the story. Tell the story until it's done. Tell it how you want to tell it so that it has everything in it that you want to be in it. And that's the story that you have. And don't worry about, oh, it has to be this length or that length. Because then it won't be the story. You know, that's good advice. Because ultimately what I had to do was remove any kind of personality right. from the story. Any kind of my my own voice had to go. And it had to become just the facts, ma'am. And right. not even all the facts. Just the, most the headlines right. of the facts, you know. The and, very, very most important facts only. Well, I, I, you know what? There are people like, uh, what's his name? Nathan Lee, that are, just excel with the, the drabbles and the super tiny stories. Was it Nathan Lee? Yes. Because I'd hate to compliment him undully. These guys are just really good at coming up with a, an idea that is small and then writing a good version of that idea. And, and yeah, it's not one of my strengths. I don't know. I, mean, I guess it's become popular of late. I don't understand why it's popular, to tell you the truth. Like those twitfic things. Yeah. Where it's what, a hundred and... hundred characters. hundred characters. Yes. I actually did one of those once. It's the only one that I'll ever do. And it was a miracle because I sat down, I, I had the idea, and I thought, no, well, I'll write that. And I sat down and I wrote it. And it was exactly a hundred characters just by chance. So I didn't have to do any editing on wow, it. That's kind of amazing. It was. And so, yeah, I just like, no, oh, well, that's it. There's my one and only ever trick fic. But yeah, it's weird because I don't understand really why that kind of stuff has become popular. You would think now that everybody just does websites. They don't do books anymore. Everybody publishes fiction on their website now. Why would there be a limit on how long a story could be? Mm. You don't need to get it in a certain number of pages. You can just make it endless. You could publish a whole friggin' book and it wouldn't be any worse than publishing a 500-word story. So why does everybody always want to limit it? Well, I think it's because people have much shorter attention spans. Yeah, maybe than that's it. Did. People can only read 100-word stories these days. I've heard the, the word drabble comes from a Monty Python skit. Yeah, I couldn't believe that. Where uh, they were joking. It was like the Olympics, but for novel writing. Yeah. And, 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 you know, remember they were, they, I know you've seen this because we watched it together and it's like, the, the first word is the, and, you know, they've got a commentator and, and like it's some sporting event and, and these guys are sitting in front of a typewriter competing against one another. And I, yeah, I think later they were talking about, and there's the 500 yard dash and then there's the hundred meter kind of, or I, I help me out. I know nothing of. I, I can't. I, but the, for some the reason, it's so fuzzy in my memory. But... Of of the race was the drabble, and yeah. it was just a it was a hundred word novel. It's a ridiculous thing, and and how somehow we've taken this joke and turned it into something to bother with kind of surprises me, to tell you the truth. But I don't know. You you seem to value those things even more than I do. So somehow, yeah, you keep bothering with that. Every month or so, I get some email from you like, yeah, here's this story. It's a drabble and I need to get another 40 words out of it. Can you help? I'm just like, why are you doing this again? This compulsion. And you hate it so much editing down the story to the exact number of words it has to be. And yet, well, it's you keep going back and punishing yourself the, again. Part of it is that it's not a skill that I have. It's, I want to be a writer. I want to write for a living. And so if there's something I'm weak at, I feel like I need to either work at it until I'm good at it or work at it until I like it. Do you know what I mean? It's mm. like, oh, nobody likes to do free throws. We, we always talk about the basketball thing because it's the only <laughs> sport I know. But it's, that's how it is. And when I was in college, I would write these scripts. And the very first screenwriting teacher that we had just adored the stuff that I wrote, as we've explained on the air lots of times. But then the next year, I took a more advanced screenwriting class. And she, the professor, had like very strict length requirements. And I used to just be like, eh, I don't care. I'll triple the length requirements. And, and then one day she says, no more. No, you have to write within these parameters. If you write a word over, you're going to get an F. And I was like, what? But, but, but this is me. 
I, uh, <laughs> rules don't apply to me. <laughs> and she would just make it be 10 pages or less or X number. They don't really do words in screenwriting because right. you can have 10 pages of dialogue and it's very few words um, or 10 pages of description and it's a ton of words. But it, that was something that she would try and hammer into me is like, you need to learn to say the same thing in fewer words. And that, because I guess that's how screenwriting goes. If, if your screenplay is 135 pages long, nobody's going to read it. You, you know how that is. They, they've said that about three hour movies or even two hour comedies too long. Nobody's going to sit for a two hour comedy. I'm sorry. Speaking of movies and books and James Potter said, I write mainly for myself. If I wrote for others, I would never be satisfied. The work would never be perfect enough. I also have my 15-year-old son read it. He read the first part of a short I just completed, before it was completed, and said it was awesome. He rated it a 9 on a scale of 1 to 10. My mother read it when I was three-fourths done and asked me how I got so twisted. LOL. She thought it was great, but scary. That's funny. I, I gave my last story to my son and had him read it, and he gave me a nine, too, out of a hundred. Oh. <laughs> so so I guess I got some work to have, do. Have you ever had your kids read your stuff? I haven't, no. I, I, I may have written a, like a really, really short like kids book kind of thing that they may have read, but I've never had them read anything. I was thinking of reading my Broken Mirror story from last year to them, the one about the kid being proclaimed king, which was called Queen Bee. Oh, okay. I remember. That was, was a more thinking, kid-friendly kind of thing. Yeah, they were, all, of course, all children because it was stated in the instructions. I remember you being like, man... Who keeps writing all these damn kids stories about kids? Where are we going to get voices for kids? Oh, that's my fault. I came up with that premise, like, didn't I? We're supposed to have genuine kids? What are we, the fudge and doom, Steve? <laughs> I considered reading them that, but I haven't yet. Nathaniel Lee said, You can't ever know, really. There are some very famous authors who have spoken slash written publicly about how gobsmacked they were when something they thought was mediocre went nova and launched their careers. Part of that is because beyond the basic mechanics of writing, there isn't really an objective measure of how good something is. Everyone likes different aspects of different things. And mostly, you just have to hope to get lucky if your goal is to be successful, at least financially. My approach is to write stuff that I think is good and leave success to itself. If I somehow spark and start winning widespread praise, so much the better. But I can't use other people's metrics to determine whether my stuff is good or not because other people use different measures of quality. Most of my stuff, in fact, meets with near universal disdain or at least confusion. You can't get into the frame of mind where you think that determines whether your stuff is actually good enough. You are the only one who can set your own limits for when you're satisfied with a particular piece. Okay, well, that's good. And, and yeah, there's Nathaniel Lee. Already yeah. mentioned before his comment even came up. That's how awesome Nathaniel Lee is. Yeah, but according to him, his stuff meets almost universal disdain from me. And... <laughs> Just the, the universe is against him. He writes something and then he gets struck by lightning or a, a meteor <laughs> falls on his head. It's a big fissure opens up. That's the disdain he's garnering. We did a recent That Gets My Goat where we talked about writing. If, if this conversation is at all interesting to you, I suggest you go over to our blog and listen to, to uh, what was it, 68 that gets my goat 68. We ought to do a special episode for gets my goat 69, huh? Okay. <laughs> Consider it done. And in that, we, I was talking about a conversation that I had with a high school friend. And he said, you know, movies suck. Books suck. Life outside of the warm embrace of Jesus does just totally sucks. There's only one book series that's worth reading of all the books that have ever been written. And it's the <laughs> Inheritance, 
trilogy? Is that what it's called? It's not. It can't be called trilogy though, because there was four. Oh, inheritance okay. cycle, maybe. Okay, well, there are these Christopher Paolini Aragon books, right? And he just—I mean, he was not kidding. He said Harry Potter was crap, but these inheritance books were nigh unto divine. I was gobsmacked to use the word <laughs> that was just used to hear him say that because I did not respond at all to Aragon. Is it? Am I saying it's it right? Aragon, not Aragorn. I've not read any of the follow-ups to Stephanie Meyer's Twilight because I reacted so adversely to the, the first Twilight. I mean, I just, I, I hated it. Mm -hmm. But you can't say she should never have written those. Christopher Paolini should never have written these. They've made millions. I mean, Stephanie Meyer could probably buy a county with these, these Twilight proceeds and all that. These books speak to people. People become hyper passionate about the characters, about the situations. I think it's fair to say that these Twilight books have changed people's lives. Same thing with the inheritance books. And so it doesn't matter that I just, ugh, I reacted in that way to that. Obviously, Paolini thinks a lot of himself, and I, I don't know anything about Stephanie Meyer, but she has to feel that it was really, really good, and it's super compelling whether Bella chooses Edward or Jacob, so that she would continue to write it. Maybe, maybe not, but just to write that first Twilight book, I don't think that there was a gigantic dollar sign waiting for her on the other end of writing that book. No. And same with Aragon. I mean, I, that's something that he wrote because he was passionate about it, because he, was, he, he wanted to write it. Mm -hmm. because he just loved Star Wars. <laughs> and it was later that somebody else picked this up and was like, wow, either I personally am affected by this or I think we can sell this. And I'm not going to be cynical and say that it was definitely I can sell this. Dear Rish, I wish you'd stop coming to my house and taking Big away from his husbandly duties. You're a corrupting influence on my children, <laughs> our cat, and leopard gecko. The sooner you pass away, the sooner decent folks and society in general can get back to where they can be truly happy. It looks like your wife sent that one in. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, Not that it isn't true, but... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, Christopher K. Munro, known as Munzee to his friends, and Rish... He says, I know when what I've written is good because people tell me. Until I start letting people read it, I don't worry about things like that. I just tell the story I want to tell and leave it be. Conveniently, my theater background kicks in here because due to doing a lot of improv, I can get a lot of ideas out. And due to auditioning, I can walk off a lot of rejection without being too, too bothered by it. Still bothered, but not as much as some, I gather. So yeah, I'll add my voice to the growing consensus that people shouldn't worry about if their work is good until it's done, or let those worries affect their work. You know, that's a really wise thing that uh, Munzee had to say there. I learned that the hard way once back uh, many years ago. Eight or nine years ago, I was writing a story. I was cruising along and chugging through it and really enjoying it. It was going to be a long story. I was probably 10 pages into this story and I was still just starting. And I decided to show it to my wife and she read it and she didn't like it. She's like, oh, yeah, well, this character is just too much of a nerd for me to like. I can't. And all of a sudden I thought, well, shoot, I guess I better change this. And I... I better do this and change that. And I started thinking about how I was going to change it. And then I never wrote anything on that story again. And the story died right there. And so, yeah, there's a good reason why you don't show someone something until it's finished. And you can't know whether it's good, I guess, until someone says, hey, this is good. But you've got to finish it first. Because, like you said, you know, writing is a solo thing. You are sitting there in front of that computer screen and typing away all by yourself in a room uh, with no windows and no doors. Wait, that's gone too far. But yeah, you know, you're, you're there by yourself writing this and you want to 
share it with somebody. You want people to see it. You're like, wow, this is good. I think you're typing it away and you're like, oh, I like it. This is going to be good. And so you want to share it with someone, but don't do it. I know you want the praise and you want people to say, good boy, but you got to wait until you're finished or else it's not going to happen. If they, somebody says something, then automatically you'll probably do the same thing that I did and you'll start trying to rewrite it and then maybe you'll rewrite it. Maybe you'll start over, but much more likely is you'll just lose steam and quit like I did. And I keep mentioning someday that alien love story is going to get written. Well, that, that was an idea that you were very passionate about when it came to you. And somehow that has continued. In the back of your mind, you know that that's a good idea for a story. And that's something that we've discussed many times. But in the case of my Broken Mirror story, I really struggled with what is it going to be about? What, it, what could somebody say on the phone? And, and that's sort of where I focused. It's like, okay, what is that one word going to be? And what would the fallout from that one word be? And I, I came up with several scenarios until I came up with one where I was like, ooh, ooh, okay, that sounds good. Even then, the story itself might not have come out good. Just because you have a good idea, you could blow it. I mean, how many times have you heard the description of a movie or something and you rent it and you're like, oh... Well, that sounded good, but that was not good. Right. But it takes a certain kind of skill to carry a good idea through to its conclusion, to, to be a good story, a good right. movie, a good screenplay, a good song. And that's a skill that I, I guess you have to learn. And I don't know at what point do you realize that you're going off the rails or it's starting not to work. And maybe that's not something you can know. Maybe if you realize once it's done that it wasn't good, you have to try again. Write another one. Do it better the next time. Yeah, I think that's kind of uh, basically the way it has to go. You, you do your best to make it good, and if it's not good, well, you write another one, and you keep going until you practice it enough that you'll hit that free throw every time. You know what I mean? You get to the point when you've done enough writing that every story you write will be good. And so you send a story off somewhere and it'll sell. You won't have to send it to 100 places for it to get sold. You'll send it to 10 or 5 or less and somebody will pick it up. And I think some of that comes from oh, you've written enough good stories that people are just like, oh, a Rich Outfield story, yeah, I'll take it. That, that would be oh, nice. That but I nice. should have said that after I read it. Dang, this one actually kind of sucks, but I already <laughs> said I'll take it. Uh, so I guess I'll take it. I think that's part of the whole deal of developing your talent until it's something where you're talented. It's not just a natural ability. It's practice and hard work that turns it into something that's really good. Lastly, uh, Renee Chambliss said, uh, what is good, quote unquote? Nothing is empirically good. You can see that from all the comments to the Doonstief stories. Some work for some people and some work for others. And then there's Rish Outfield stories. Hmm. Your all-time favorite story by your absolutely favorite author will be considered crap by some people. If you are getting consistent feedback that you need to improve some element of your writing and storytelling, then work on that. Work on your stories until they feel right to you. But beyond that, you'll never write something good. No one does, because good is different for everyone. I doubt myself and my writing ability all the time. I'm really good at forgetting the compliments I've received about various stories. I have an elephant-like memory when it comes to criticism, though. So I relate to your post and can get paralyzed by perfectionism. But if you spend too much energy worrying about being good, you won't share your stories. And that would be a shame. That was a really good comment, huh? Yeah. Sounds like someone's got it out for you, sir. <laughs> no, 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 you inserted the part where she mentioned Rish Outfield stories are crap. No, no, no. I'm just saying you can't be paralyzed by fear or you won't share your stories and that would be a shame. Oh, you think that she was talking to me and not no, just everyone? No, I don't think she was talking to you, but oh, okay. you should think she was talking to you because she was. <laughs> share your stories, sir. Don't sit on them like eggs in a nest. 
let them fly like fledgling birds. Oh, that's something that Munsey said, you know, that he, he was an actor and he's gone to many auditions and he's learned to build up a, a tolerance to Iocane powder. And that's something that I, I never really learned. Going to an audition, not getting a part made me not go to more auditions. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's, it's a skill that you need to learn. I, I know that I'm repeating myself because there are certain things that you know, that you know you need to work on, that you know you need to improve. There are weaknesses that you know you have. But knowing it is only half the battle. <laughs> that doesn't mean that you'll actually improve, that you'll work. You know what I mean? It's just like, I know I shouldn't eat four more brownies. But they're still there. We were just talking about that today because that's something that I'm going through right now again is trying to lose excess weight. We're kind of having a contest at work where we're uh, trying to see who loses the most weight over a period of time. And me and this other guy were saying, you know, what we really want to do, and he he's the one that came up with the thing, is like, you know, if this is over and we haven't gotten to where we want to be, maybe we'll just throw another 20 bucks in another pot and do it again for another three months until we get to where we want to be and we're happy. I, I really want to be able to get to the point... Where I can sit down and say, sure, yeah, I'll have a slice of pizza. And and when I'm done with my slice of pizza, well, I'll get up and walk away. Sure, there's nine other pieces, but I don't have to eat any of them. I'm just going to eat this one and I'll be happy with that. See, that's not you. It's not me. That's the thing. I'd like it to become me because I'm the guy who's like, there's nine pieces of pizza. I probably could get seven of those gone before the other people get to them. <laughs> and that's the, that's the other thing. I also need to get to the point where I say, yeah, this is the one piece that I'm going to eat. And I get up and I walk away. And when I come back through and the nine pieces are still there, I don't go, oh, well, they're still here. I'll just have another. <laughs> And uh, I'm not sure how I got onto that. No, no, no. It's just, it's. Uh, I was saying that we know. Oh, right, what our, right. our weaknesses are. We know where we need to improve, but just knowing it doesn't mean anything. It's, it's You can have a problem with alcohol and still go to where alcohol is being served and come home and, and, and regret what you've done. When I was really trying to watch my weight, I had some crazy rule where I would eat nothing after 9 p.m. It was my rule, nothing. And sometimes I would be so hungry, I felt like crying, you know, it'd be like 11.45 and it's like, ah. That's and, when it's time to just go to bed. And now <laughs> I, I'm aware of that rule that I once had years ago. But if I'm hungry and it's 1.30 in the morning, I'll eat. I, I just, I don't care anymore. Right before, how long have you been doing this, this dieting thing? Three weeks, four weeks? Yeah, it's four weeks. Right before you started, you and I went to this buffet, mm -hmm. all-you-can-eat pizza buffet. And it was really, really good. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming that that's the last time you had all-you-could-eat pizza because you've mm -hmm. lost a ton of weight. Not a metric ton of weight, but... But a standard... A shit ton. An imperial ton. I, I long for all-you-can-eat pizza, that kind of thing. Just the idea of all-you-can-eat. <laughs> and I realize that that's kind of an American thing. It's like grand symbol of American decadence. All-you-can-eat uh -huh. buffet. Just, yeah, the knowledge that if I want more, I can have more. I can have more after that. It's hard to push yourself away from the, the table and and stop. And I, I don't know why we're talking about food now. I'm sorry. We're, ta I we're like talking food. about food. I'm actually food. hungry now. So we probably had ought to stop talking about food. But yeah, I, the whole buffet thing and the all you can eat thing is fine. As long as it's done in moderation, you can't do it often. But if you do it once every six months, that's not a big deal. You can pig out here and there and you'll be fine. But that's not been my M.O., I pig out as often as possible, and therefore I am a pig. So do you, you're, <laughs> you're only a third of the way through. That's your, right. I've got two wow. full months to go. That's Hopefully crazy. by then I will have broken that longing, and I won't be like, oh, I long for that pizza buffet. Hopefully See, by then I can just say, you know, it would be nice to go and get a slice of pizza. Well, yeah, you don't want to go to the pizza buffet. Yeah, you, you want to go to Sparrow's buffet. or something like that, where it's eight fifty for one piece. Mm, that's actually not cheaper. The buffet was cheaper than that. I'm, but you would be 
loathe to order a second piece of <laughs> those eight fifty for one. <laughs> You know, it's a process. All of this stuff is a process. Uh, learning to curb your appetites or to be a better person or a better father or a better writer. They're not just something that you can snap your fingers and it's done. You just got to work on it and you're going to backslide and you're going to make advances and then you're going to forget about those advances. And sometimes when we see writers who were really, really, really good at a very young age, you're just like, why even bother? I'll never be that good. But those same writers sometimes once they reach 50 – they backslide in a way. So. Yeah, they lose that magic they had. And I don't know how that happens except for just being told that you're really, really good for so long. You stop trying or you get bored or complacent. I, maybe there's no answer for that either. Maybe each individual has their own deal. I'm sure I think with, with Stephen King, it was just like he stopped using drugs. <laughs> and I don't know. But hey, I thank everybody that commented on this. And if there were people that commented and I didn't share your uh, comments, I'm sorry about that. It was weeks ago. It was a long time ago. I have no idea how long ago it was that I asked that musical question. And uh, I just printed out. Is he really going out with her? Him. Sorry. I did she. a backwards accident. You did? Why? I don't know. Big Anklevich. So pathetic it'd be funny if it wasn't so sad. Good song. But it's... Uh, Getting cancer is much better than listening to you guys. It's a, a conversation that comes up again and again and again. And, and maybe that's another one of those things. We could do the podcast for 20 years and we'd still be talking about writing and what I accomplished and what I didn't accomplish and all that. Just because... Mostly what we didn't accomplish, probably. <laughs> even 20 years from now. I think Big is right. <laughs> But if you could look at yourself 20 years from now and you discovered that you were still trying and you were still writing and you were still occasionally submitting them places, would that bum you out or would you be like, wow, good for him? That'd probably be good. I would think that it still hadn't given up. That's the good thing about writing is there's no age limit on it. It's not like being a movie star. You you don't start out in acting when you're 45 or something like that because there's, you know, movies are about young people and here and there there's character parts for old fat people or something like that. But And the same thing in sports. If you wanted to be a sports star, you got to do it when you're young. If you're not doing it all through your youth and ready to go when you're 18, then you're too old already. I mean, Dennis Quaid might be able to be a pitcher when he's old, but... He's an aberration and, you know, it's just a Disney movie to make people feel good. But with writing, it doesn't matter because nobody sees you. They just read what you have to say. You don't compete against anyone else, really. You just put something out there for people to read. And if you make something good, it doesn't matter how old or how young you are. All that matters is what you actually put on the page. And so I hope that I'm still trying 20 years from now. I hope that I've tried a lot better than I have up until now. Well, if you could talk to yourself in 2032 and the older you said... Do they have telephones that go all the way down to hell? CB radio. <laughs> oh. And you have to say breaker one niner. Oh. But you talk to yourself and your older self says, no, I, I, I put that dream away long ago. I don't bother with any of that stuff anymore. Would that not bum you out to find that out? Or like, really? It probably would. Probably. I guess it depends on what goes along with that. If there's some kind of a story that makes sense. And I said, no, I put that away. And I started on some other thing that worked out so much better. And, and now I'm rich as freaking Bill Gates. So... You know, it actually worked out all for the good. Then maybe I would not be so bummed. All right. Well, you put a silver lining on what was meant to be just a very sad, depressing <laughs> end to this conversation. So good for you. And you said that you don't compete against anybody else. Now, that's a good attitude to have. I, I don't know that that's realistic, though. Like with the broken mirror story, you were competing about <laughs> other people. And with sending your stuff out there, I would imagine you're competing with other people. But But it's good to keep in mind that the only person that it really matters to beat is yourself or improve upon is yourself. I know it, I know what you're saying. <laughs> I, I use the wrong terminology. I've heard that about you. 
Okay, well, I should have quit when I was ahead <laughs> with the CB radio comment. Thank you. <laughs> we did want a block of flats, not an abattoir. Thank you. Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. So that brings us to the end of another episode. A kind of an emergency episode, a very <laughs> short notice. Well, the episode wasn't short. Somehow we managed to fill, fill a full hour. Okay, the story was short, though. It was. So some people are long gone. <laughs> they listened to none of this, and they are so much happier than the rest of you. But if you like to listen to us prattle on for even longer, our buddy J.M. Perkins, John to you. He of chemo fame. Right. Dang, there's another chemo story we got to do sometime. Shoot, put that on the to-do list. Okay, to-do. Uh, as far as I know, he's got more than one podcast, but the one that, the only one that matters is That's the one that we're on the John versus Patrick podcast. It's over at www.johnvspatrick.com. And he and his nemesis, Patrick, compete. They each contribute to the site in sort of a one upmanship contest trying to outdo the other and it's like oh so you do this i do this okay i've never been to the site <laughs> but my guess is that somewhere on that site we did an interview with john and he said about a half hour you know up to an hour kind of thing will be great i'll cut it down to half an hour and it'll be fine and we went for more than two hours to <laughs> that's we? right but it was really cool because he had some questions for us that I don't know if he asks everybody, but questions that I guess he'd wanted to know. We did talk a great deal about writing. We talked about movies. We talked about screenplays. We talked about our influences and our childhoods. And I told him about being 26 and wetting the bed. And he laughed. And then we just we talked about our show and how the show came to be and our own writing and his writing because you know he's the guy that wrote the chemo stories which together make a giant chemo adventure a feature novel novel I think might be a good word I believe that novel is as we speak getting ready to be published I believe he's got a kickstarter campaign he's trying to do perfect you crystallized my thoughts eloquently there he's got a kickstarter campaign of trying to get enough people committed to buy it or to read the entire novel adventure thing <laughs> that he will be able to publish it he, he's written several chemo stories and they all fit together in a narrative and he's just trying to get up a, a little bit of interest so that he can put it out there and that you can read the whole adventure. Uh, why do I keep saying adventure? It is an adventure. It's right? so adventurous. The greatest adventure is what lies ahead. That's right. You Don't know what? say goodbye. Say, say good, good journey. journey. Here's the funny thing. We like to hear ourselves talk. <laughs> you like yourself, don't you, Biggie? But uh, John was just really interesting, really fun to talk to. We could have talked for hours with this guy. He he seems to have similar interests, even though he's like 13 and he's done so much more than I will ever do. <laughs> he yeah. once killed a man in Reno just to watch him die. Now he's stuck in Folsom Prison. Well, good, because have you seen this guy? That's where he belongs. <laughs> no, that's Patrick. You're thinking oh. About. oh, John's um, the one on the other side. Well, John wins. I mean, look at those two guys. Anyhow, if you want to go over there, hijinks ensue. And also, we will put a link to his Kickstarter campaign. Cam Thank you. Active. <laughs> so that if you are a fan of those stories, you can contribute to getting that done. But yeah, check it out. It's uh, over there. There's a link in the show notes so you can swing on over and listen to our lovely interview. And hey, I appreciate you writing the story for no pay, basically, <laughs> and no recognition. Oh, I'm taking a big slice of donations for that one. I'm just going to go spend it on booze and riotous living. All right. More power to you, sir. Thank you. Since you have access to the pot <laughs> and I do not. We got an episode done. 
it's still April, right? Hopefully. And we got it done and we are going to be working on another one. And hopefully we will be back in your neighborhood again soon. But one last thing, if you want to talk about how great Big Story was or anything else, we've got forums. We haven't plugged them in a long time. It's dunsteef.freeforums, one word, dot org. And there's a link to that uh, on the side of the page every day. There's all sorts of different topics on the forums, and it's it's meant to be fun. Most of the time it is. But I've noticed it's the same people posting again and again, and so it's starting to smell in there. <laughs> so if you want to come on over and create an account and post, it doesn't make you do the little nonsense word that you have to retype at the bottom like Big Site does. So you can save yourself a headache from that. And there you go. Come on over and, and check it out. Uh, lots of fun at the forums to be had. If you haven't been there yet, you probably have missed the lightning round in the movie quotes game. Which That's is all right. The Nobody cares. Longest cared. running thread in the whole thing. It's got like forty something pages, whereas the next highest has probably got ten tops. So there's that. All right. Good fortune to you, Big. <laughs> oh wait, we don't do that anymore, do we? Yeah, that was a little unfortunate. Ew. Two on the nose. Because his story was was called unfortunate, and he and he uh, and, and he said it was it was too unfortunate, and he uh, he shouldn't have. He that that was the problem. Was uh... good night. Good night. Looks like we're out of time. Thanks for listening to the Dune Steve. The Dune Steve is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So you can give it to anyone, but you cannot change it or make money off it. If you're ever in a generous mood, or even if you're not, please donate. Take two. It's so weird. I mean, I hate Twilight so much, but I can never not compliment Twilight. I hope that makes me open-minded. It makes you something-minded anyway. Probably simple-minded might be the best description. Stay. Bark, bark, wagtail. Good boy. Good boy.